Hello, and welcome back to Game Review. My name is Caleb Denby, and today I wanted to take a look at one of my own games that I'm uh, kind of proud of uh, at a tournament I recently played at the US Amateur Team East, or also known as the, the World Amateur Team Tournament, all the way out in Parsippany, New Jersey. Uh, made quite a trip here, uh, all the way from St. Louis, and I got to play some strong players for it. Uh, this is a game I actually had against Andrew Tang, and why don't we take a look at it? The game started with d4, knight f6, and bishop f4, uh, entering the London system. Uh, I play a line with e6, now e3, b6, knight f3, very simple, natural developing moves by white. Uh, white, of course, putting all the pieces on the London squares, and then continuing, continuing with the game. Uh, I continued with bishop e7, not really the main stuff, but uh, the London isn't really the type of pressing opening where you have to be very, very meticulous about your move orders and play deep theoretical knowledge. You can kind of put your pieces where you want to put them because white isn't making huge claims in the center with just this d-pawn. Uh, white continued with knight bd2, and I challenged the center a little bit with c5, and now after c3, I went ahead and castled. Uh, black, or white plays this move h3, giving this bishop a little bit of a flight square in the event that knight h5 ever comes on the board. And now uh, I had a decision to make here. Uh, I could play d6, I could play d5, or I could start developing my queen side pieces. But uh, in the game, uh, there was actually a very distinct reason I had left these two pieces undeveloped. And for that reason, I chose my next move, d6. This move is aimed at controlling this e5 square, preventing this knight from jumping into it, and uh, also allowing white the opportunity to develop his bishop, which is exactly what I wanted. Uh, now, due to the fact that these two pieces have remained undeveloped, I have this extra option here to not develop this bishop to b7, but instead to come all the way out to a6 and trade off white's most important minor piece in the London, that being this very powerful light squared bishop. Uh, so now that I'm getting rid of this bishop, of course the move like uh, bishop c2 wouldn't really be advisable. You can't really castle with this bishop on a6, and black would actually have a little bit of an advantage here. So white does in fact take off these bishops. Uh, now uh, white simply castles, and here the downside to my play, yes I got rid of white's most important minor piece, but my knight is a bit sidelined. So I simply take this time to bring this knight back to b8 where it started, and so on the next move, I can come up to c6, which is a much better square for this knight, controlling the center, controlling the a-file. In the meantime, white has played a4, a very nice move, restricting my plan of expanding on the queen side. Uh, but I just continued, uh, white continues with knight c4, making threats on d6. So I took on d4, making sure the queen couldn't join in on that fun. e takes d4, I simply keep improving my pieces with rook c8, Rook e1, uh, now I continue with d5. I could, in theory, try to continue with my plan on the queen side, but the fact of the matter is, it's just a little bit too slow in this case. You can imagine moves like knight e3 coming on the board, and now if I want to keep playing on the queen side, if I really force the issue, I'm going to run into moves like d5 coming from white. And this is something you have to be a little bit care careful of. You have to always be calculating, making sure that your plans aren't too slow for the position. So because of that, in this case, I realized d5 was really a main threat from white. That was something he was, he was hoping to achieve. So I play d5 myself, taking away that option. This knight now jumps into e5. Uh, I'm more than happy to take off these knights and play knight e4 myself. Uh, this is another idea behind d5. Controlling this e4 square allows me to improve this piece. This queen jumps out to e2, uh, perhaps eyeing to make some threats on this e6 square. And at this time, I realized that this bishop is actually a lot more useful than my bishop here on e7. Um, you might have been told that, in theory, the good bishop is the bishop on the other color, the opposite color to your pawn structure, and the bad bishop is the bishop locked on the same color as your main pawn structure or pawn chain. But in this case, it turns out the white's bishop is more useful than black's, in my opinion. Uh, White's bishop, on this very natural diagonal, is controlling some key important squares. Meanwhile, this bishop, it's controlling a lot of squares, but they aren't the most relevant ones. 
Uh, you know, I very much would like to put my pieces on squares like c7 and b8, but I simply can't with this bishop here. Because of that, the best moves are aimed at actually contesting this bishop. So a move like bishop d6 would be good. Instead, I chose bishop h4, highlighting that this pawn is a bit weak. Uh, Andrew brought his rook back to f1 to defend it. And then I play bishop g5, uh, offering a trade of these bishops. White accepts, and now continues with a5, trying to put some pressure on my queenside structure here. Um, I continued with queen d2, the idea being you can't really take this queen due to some tactics here. Knight b3 will come with a fork. So instead of takes, we see queen b5, and now I simply capture on a5 uh, with the idea of using this b-file to attack this b-pawn. Uh, Andrew played the nice move, knight f3, uh, trying to force this queen out of d2. And in the game, I did not think it would be advisable to come to c2, because it looks as though rook c1 traps my queen, but actually here there, there's a very funny, funny move to save the queen. I'll let you try to find it. Of course, it is a6, drawing this queen away from uh, some important squares. I was never going to find this in the game, though, so I simply retreated my queen back to f4. A very natural move. Uh, Andrew takes on a5. A uh, very natural play by me. I just play the rook to b8. Nothing too fancy, nothing too complicated. Just put the pieces on good squares. The queen comes back to e2. Now I want to attack this pawn, and I want to defend this pawn. So rook b7 from me. This rook comes over to a1. I simply play rook b8, with the point being that if white wants to capture this a pawn, I'll go ahead and capture this b pawn with tempo on the queen, with threats to f2. So, of course, Andrew doesn't take on a7, instead simply bringing this rook back to defend this b-pawn. Uh, and from here, I play the move h6, creating left for my king, getting out of any back rank mate uh, threats. Uh, Andrew continued with g3, forcing this queen back, and now he tries to reroute this knight. Um, and this position is actually pretty balanced. Uh, Andrew does have a plan to improve it though, and it all involves using this knight effectively. So for the moment, these two pawns kind of hang in this balance where if either side wants to uh, capture the other one, they're going to lose uh, the, the pawn left behind. And there, there wouldn't be uh, much for white if he loses this b-pawn. In fact, black would be significantly better due to this weakness on c3 if this b-pawn were to fall. So to uh, kind of fix this problem, Andrew wants to bring his knight back to d3, freeing up his rooks to take this a-pawn. However, black uh, can't, can't meet this pretty adequately here. I chose a5, and after knight d3, I'm simply going to play rook b5, defending this pawn uh, from this uh, threat that the rooks have, have made to it. White improves his king with king g2, and now I decide it's time to improve my own knight as well. I want to put more pressure on b2, so I do so with knight d6, the idea being I want to come in to c4. Uh, white now plays knight c5, making a threat, of course, knight a6, can't allow that, so simply queen c6 defends. Note that since this knight has vacated the d3 square, once again, I don't really have to defend this pawn, thanks to this move, rook takes b2. Uh, so instead of that, uh, Andrew actually brings this rook over to e1, which was a pretty strange move to my eyes. I'm not sure what he wanted to achieve with this rook on e1. I simply continued with my plan, uh, knight c4. Uh, additionally, this move has the nice side effect of controlling the e6 square, which may, may have been uh, on Andrew's mind with the move rook e1. Some, some nasty sacrifices here, but no need to worry. So knight c4 attacks this b-pawn uh, as I wanted. And now perhaps the best move for white is simply knight b3. Uh, bringing this, this knight back to defend the pawn once again, and trying to keep this balance. Instead, uh, white plays this move, b3. And now, uh, I'll let you at home try to find the move that really actually gives black a substantial advantage here. Um, it should be uh, uh, kind of natural to you uh, to want to play this move, uh, because it really just kind of destroys the entire white, white structure. Alright, hopefully you found it. Of course, it is not knight d6 not rook takes b3, but rook takes c5. Uh, the exchange sacrifice here is actually quite good for black. Uh, it's what I played in the game as well. Uh, of course, you can't take the knight, the rook will recapture, so white must take the rook. But now after rook takes b3, uh, black only has one pawn for the exchange at the moment, 
but C5 will fall soon after, and there's going to be some nasty pressure on the C3 pawn as well. In the meantime, the knight is locked on a very nice outpost on C4, controlling this A5 pawn as well, making sure there's no threats to it. And uh, so because of this, black actually has a pretty nice edge here. Uh, white continued with queen c2, attacking uh, the rook, defending the pawn. I play the move rook b5. Perhaps actually better here is rook b8. The idea being you can avoid the rook trade uh, from b8, whereas after rook b5 and rook uh, to b1, you cannot avoid the rook trade due to rook b8 with some back rank issues for black. So after rook b5, rook b1, I play the move d4 check. And uh, after king g1, I sat there and I, I calculated and I calculated and I calculated some more and I couldn't figure it out. It was just too complicated for me. It turns out the move 95 uh, does actually grant black a little bit of an edge. After rook takes b5, the most natural move, we play knight f3 check. Of course, the king can't come to these two squares because 91 check would pick up the queen uh, or actually an, an also kind of checkmate. So instead we see, after knight f3 check, white would play king f1, queen takes b5, and now the move c4 is actually the best white can do, when in fact after queen takes c5, black has a nice little hold on the position, with this queen very naturally defending the pawns, and this knight going to come back to e5 and put some pressure on c4. Uh, the line that I didn't like was after queen e2 check, I really couldn't figure out this position in my head, with knight e1 and d takes c3, in my head, I was kind of just terrified of this c-pawn, and I didn't want to really go in for this. So I calculated, and I calculated, and I calculated, and I couldn't figure it out. So in the game, I gave up and took on c3. But unfortunately for me, this allows white some very nice, uh, very nice moves here. He takes on b5. Immediately, you cannot capture this pawn due to queen b1 check with a nasty fork. So Andrew simply brings this rook back to a1, also eyeing rook c1 to keep control of these pawns. I capture on c5, but now after queen c3, uh, white is going to have a distinct advantage here. My extra pawns are on e6 and a5, neither of them are really going to be useful, and so the extra exchange is worth quite a bit more here. I played queen d5, trying to unpin. Andrew played queen b3, trying to pin. I played queen e4, trying to unpin. Andrew played rook a4, trying to pin. I played queen e1, trying to unpin. Uh, white played king g2, and then I celebrated because I unpinned, and then I immediately pinned myself again with queen e4 check. And now after king h2, uh, I'm actually not able to, to save this knight from capture here. Uh, there's no way to break free from this pin besides to play queen e2. And this gives Andrew a very interesting opportunity here to go in for a, a pretty unique endgame. An endgame that I hadn't seen before. Maybe, maybe Andrew had seen it before. I'm sure he's played more chess than me. But that endgame would be after queen takes c4. Uh, of course, you can't take this with the rook because this is a simple draw. But queen takes c4 is, is a try. Queen takes f2 check. If you want to avoid the perpetual, you can't go back to h2. So you play king g1. And now we would end up in quite an interesting endgame where eventually um, white is going to have to avoid the checks by offering up a trade of queens. Let's say with queen d3 here, takes takes, and after move like g5 and rook takes a5, you're going to have four pawns for black in exchange for a rook. And this isn't really an endgame I had ever had the pleasure of playing before, but it turns out it should be a draw. Should be a draw. Who knows what would have happened if we ever got here in the game, but Andrew didn't like the look of it. Perhaps he thought it was risking a bit too much. Four pawns can be scary. So instead, after queen e2, he simply plays queen b8 check and reroutes this queen to f4. Uh, I continue with knight d2, creating some threats to the king. Of course, you can't take f7 because this would simply be a pretty easy draw here with the knight on f3. So Andrew uh, first stops the threat to f3, and now uh, this pawn uh, is actually under danger or in danger. So I play f6. White plays g4, giving his king a bit more space. I reroute this knight over to e5, and this gives white the opportunity to go in for this endgame. And this endgame is actually not so simple for, for black to try to draw. Uh, at first glance, the engine gives this move g5 as being black's best move to, to draw the game. But after f4 takes takes, 
and king g6, uh, there are still two pawns left on the board. And unless black is able to, to really get rid of both of them comfortably and not allow white to make a passed pawn, black's going to be in serious danger of losing this game. Uh, so instead of g5, you know, I didn't really like the look of that, I played a different move, and that is h5. h5 here with the idea being that after g takes h5, uh, hopefully I can regain this pawn with king h6 and king h5. However, I noted here that perhaps there is some danger due to this move f4 uh, perhaps coming on the board with some threats to this e-pawn, and didn't really like the look of this for, uh, for black here. So instead of going with my original plan, trying to recapture, I instead rerouted this knight over to g5 and played e5 the idea, with the idea of uh, permanently controlling this f4 square, keeping uh, white from, from ever playing f4. In the game, uh, white plays king g4, so he gets to keep this pawn now in exchange for my maneuvers. I play knight e6, rook takes a5, knight f4, and now rook a8. And thankfully for me, this turns out to be a fortress. Uh, there's, there's simply no way to really make progress for white. And I'll try and explain why now. Uh, really, the only way to make progress in this type of position is to get this king somewhere where it can kind of influence the, the base of black's pawn chain. But the problem for white is, uh, let's say I pass. Uh, the problem for white is if you play king f5 in this position, black is going to be able to take this h-pawn. And once this h-pawn disappears, uh, these two pawns are, aren't very threatening, actually. And if, as you tried in the game, you play king f5 after the knight steps to e6, white has this very nice move, knight d4 check, which guards these two squares, and the king has nothing better than to return to g4. This is what actually happened in the game. I return to e6 now. This rook steps to e8, I come back to h4, and once again we have this situation where if the king wants to advance, he'll drop the h-pawn. So, white wastes another tempo, and now he is guarding the e6 square, but there's also this e2 square for the knight to shuffle between. And so now I still have access to d4, so after king f5, knight d4 check steps on the board again, and Andrew chose king e4 in this case. And so I simply prepare to bring this, king, this knight back to f4, not allowing white to break through. And so Andrew finally gave up on breaking this fortress in this manner, and played h6. This is an, an idea uh, used by white to get my king out of its little shelter here on h7. I play king takes. Of course, it'd be a pretty big mistake to play pawn takes. It allows the white king in, and black would be very much losing. So king takes instead. Rook h8 check. King H or King G6, H5, King F7, and now my, my king has been forced from this square on H7. But unfortunately for White, it's it's still not enough to try to win the game. Rook A8 was White's choice. I bring this knight back to F4, hitting this pawn, and now after a couple checks, uh, White continues with H6, uh, all once again trying to break up the structure. In this case, I'm forced to accept this and uh, take back with my h-pawn, but thankfully the white king still can't quite get in, thanks to this move knight d5, and after the check, knight e7. And now, after king e6, this is very very clearly just going to be a draw. Uh, black has no issues with keeping this one pawn from uh, ever becoming a queen, and these two pawns are going to defend against any threats the rook can make. The game continued with king h5, knight d5, uh, king f5, king g7, knight f4, rook a6, simply knight h5 check, uh, king f7, king g5, rook a3, I played e4, advancing the pawns just a bit, and now Andrew played f3, essentially giving up on winning the game, and after a couple more moves, he took my final pawn, I captured his rook, and the game was drawn due to insufficient material. Um, so this is my game against Andrew Tang. I was pretty happy with the way that I played. Uh, managed to just play simple, natural chess. Uh, that's all you really have to do against uh, even super strong players like Andrew Tang. Just play moves that make sense, play moves that activate your pieces, and if you don't make any uh, serious mistakes, then you can't really lose the game. Uh, thank you so much for joining me on this episode of Game Review. My name is Caleb Dunby, and I will see you next time.